So this, we have this dichotomy that exists in our world, which is we constantly try to be like everybody else, but nobody, nobody, nobody is appreciated just for being like everybody else. Mm. So if you flip that on its head, you go, okay, fuck being like everybody else. Forget that. What makes me me? Yeah. What makes me exactly. unique? Yeah. Hey, let me go all in on that. The sun is coming up, are you ready to go? We can take a ride, we can take it slow. Yeah. Welcome back to the Road to Self Love. It's your boy Paul Fishman, self love coach and you do you activist. So excited and honored to be joined by Dr. D. Jaffe and Sophie Jaffe Yay. here today joining us. So, what I love about self love is that it gives us the opportunity to just own who we are and truly show up and represent ourselves. So, I always love to ask my guests, like, how do you want to be known? How do you want yeah. the people to know you? So if you got this, you got this ready, <laughs> I don't think I have one ready. How do I want to be known? <laughs> yeah, who are you? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I personally as um, a person in the space of wellness and even more that a, a human being and a mom of three, um, I'm trying to find as much intersection there as possible so that the way that my kids see me is similar to the way my friends see me, which is similar to the way my community sees me. So it's like that... I don't have like a bunch of different faces that I put on. I'm just the same in all moments. And of course we, we adjust a little bit, right. but it's really just about helping people love all parts to themselves and see, see life as a beautiful place to be in and that we are just lucky to be alive to begin with. And that so much of what we do every day is about perspective and choosing love, choosing to see this all of this as a gift and without getting too like you know, well, you know what? cheesy <laughs> like just too cheesy you're pretty cheesy baby I <laughs> I'm just saying like, you just don't if you're gonna own one version of you it's gonna be a really cheesy that's version. the face you always want to be the cheesy like, okay like so I just want to always be cheese. <laughs> cheesy no but I think that we just get so um, bombarded by other people's experiences and um, what they're doing, what they're wearing, what they're saying, what's helping them, and like just tuning into our own rhythms of what brings us joy on a on any given moment is really all that matters. And so I think I have a gift in that. I think I have a gift in a really short amount of time helping people to love themselves exactly as they are in that moment and see that like it isn't about what everyone else is doing or breathing or eating or um, saying. Mm, that's beautiful. Yeah. Do you agree that's my thing or what I'm, would I'm you kind of stuck on the cheesy thing for to be honest but um <laughs> yeah i mean i think i said this at the relationship workshop that we just led a couple of days ago yeah that what i love about you is you always almost to a fault only see the positive in everything you almost will not yeah. accept the negative which sometimes means you in your own life kind of block out the things that aren't going well for the benefit of the things that are but mm. for other people you definitely help them tune in do you feel like i still do that do yeah, i mean, better yeah, you, don't seeing... watch, you don't watch a lot of news it's like you're yeah. very purposeful about not letting sure but i'm saying if something's going on in my life where i feel like i'm struggling don't yeah, you less think so that... in your life mm -hmm. yeah. yeah i mean like outside i don't just like avoid bad bad things happening and like no heart heartbreaking things no mm -hmm. but for other people you definitely help them tune in to yes the joy and what is working, what isn't, and then you know, keeping them also keeping them accountable for their own biases and their own ways of looking at. A lot of people only look at the negative, right? They kind of, it's almost like they like to feed on it. Yeah. Mm. Mm. What did you say about the glass? The glass. <laughs> my my glass thing. On Sunday at the couples workshop, you said. Oh. The glass half full. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um. Yeah, I was just you know the. Are you either a glass half full or half empty kind of person? Mm -hmm. So I'm not developing a whole theory around it, but I was like, Sophie's not a half full or half empty kind of person. Sophie doesn't even see the glass. She just sees a bunch of liquid and fluid just flowing freely everywhere in the world. Yes, abundance. And she kind of just feels like her job is to point out as much of it to other people as possible. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. You're true. up. I'm up. Um, mine's going to be a lot shorter. I mean, I really want to leave impact i really want to leave this world knowing that i've helped make millions of people's lives better mm. um that's it it's you're a, on your it's way like the thing i'm focused on constantly is 
online focuses primarily on mental health, addiction, and relationships. But mm -hmm. you know, those things encompass almost everything in the world eventually. And so that's it. Just impact. When I leave, I want people to be able to say, "Okay, he he made a lot of people's lives better." Yeah. Mm, I feel that. That's yeah. beautiful. Would you agree? So yes, that, he's that's... all he's already doing that. He's mm. helped thousands of people through you know people going through really hard times in addiction, whatever they're struggling with, whether it be alcohol, drugs, um, mental illness, if they're struggling with sex addiction, if they're struggling with their partner, like he works with a lot of couples mm -hmm. and helps them to live better lives and break free of whatever it is, the struggle that they're going through. He helps them get to the, like the root issue and he's written a book and he does TED Talks and all of it is about helping people live better lives and heal and um, and love themselves. I think it's kind of the same. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Well, that... Accept themselves first and then hopefully love themselves. Mm. I feel like a lot of people, the idea of loving themselves is so foreign because they've looked down at themselves for so long. Mm. But I first try to help them come to terms and accept themselves. And, you know, I have this thing. I don't know if I can swear. Can I swear? Anymore? Yeah, self-love is uncensored. So um, I have this bracelet that says fuck shame on it. And uh, that's the first step for me with people is help them remove and unravel layers of shame. Mm. And then under that, there is self-love at some point. You just have to get to it. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm right there with you. Well, can we dive into that a little bit about this of idea of shame? Like, can you, can you share what exactly shame is? Sure. Sure. Um, so... Shame is a, is a feeling. It's a feeling that comes up when you feel like your internal values and who you see yourself as a person doesn't align with what other people want of you and what the world expects of you. Mm -hmm. So you feel like your inside is not acceptable to the outside world because you are too different. Mm -hmm. um, and that often comes along with stigma. Not always, because sometimes you can feel shame about things that the world doesn't stigmatize, but it's more rare. So, for instance, like homosexuality, race, addiction to mental health issues, you know, the, the list of things that we stigmatize are, are huge. Um, different religion um, practices, you know, different areas of the world. Like Muslims are heavily stigmatized in this country right now. And so shame is the feeling oftentimes that comes out of stigma. When you feel like people look down at you, when you feel like they don't accept you as you are, the feeling of shame comes out and what I tell people a lot that we don't think about is shame is a really powerful emotion because back in the day when we were still in tribes etc if you were shamed and ostracized and, and kind of swept aside from your tribe it was really literally a life risk mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. it would put you in, in danger I mean surviving without your tribe was almost impossible so what comes up for a lot of us and this is why shame in my opinion is so important is we will do anything to avoid actually feeling the feeling of shame. What does that mean? First and foremost, we'll pretend we're somebody we're not. That's the most common version. So most people I work with have been wearing masks or costumes for decades, pretending to be somebody else. Yeah. And they do it not because they don't like themselves at the core, they do it because at some point somebody made sure that they understood that other people wouldn't love them for who they are and they have to pretend. That's the first thing. And then the second thing we'll do, unfortunately, is when we feel it really strongly and we're threatened, we will easily put down somebody else, shame them, stigmatize them, make them feel less, feel less than, in order to feel superior and not have to acknowledge our own feelings of shame. And I think this is the reason for war, it's the reason for rape, it's the reason for crime, it's the reason for aggression, it's the reason for suicide it's a reason for so many things that exist at the bottom of the barrel the part that nobody wants to touch is the things they feel ashamed of mm. so sophie can you like do you have you experienced shame in your life and and is there are there places that you're still working on moving through shame i'd love to know your feelings around shame and your experience with it yeah i mean i think be, like the way that adi described me earlier is mm -hmm. like really true i don't allow myself to feel and see a lot of things that you know for better or worse that um are quote negative mm -hmm. um i personally haven't lived a life of a lot of fear a lot of shame mm -hmm. a lot of like you know mine is much my experiences have been much more tied up with 
another person. So um, when my parents got a divorce, like that affected me, but I wasn't ashamed of it. Um, it was more like I felt my mom shame. And then when my boyfriend in high school, um, you know, he was full of so much shame and did and acted out in crazy ways because of it. He was mm -hmm. hit by his dad. He came from very, a very unhappy home. And so he was physically and like emotionally and psychologically really abusive to me. So it's like mm -hmm. the byproduct of his shame affected me. I didn't. Yeah, I mean, one of the things yeah. that you, you didn't talk to almost anybody about what was going on in your relationship. No. And so, so yeah. That was one area. There aren't a lot, but there, that was one area where you knew telling other people that your boyfriend, you, you were like the popular couple in yeah. high school and everybody wanted to be like you guys. Just nobody knew that he screamed at you. He had and, this like secret. Tore your clothes up and beat you up behind closed doors. Yeah. And I think that happens to a lot of people in a music relationship. Yeah. So I think it started there. Like there were lots of opportunities of like where I could have experienced shame, but I decided not to like go down that route. But then it was like when someone else's experience with it was so heavy and strong that it spilled over into my reality and that was that started really with him mm -hmm. um and yeah I I hid the way he was with me because it was so embarrassing like I was like who who do I think I am like a lot like that's not me I don't allow people to treat me that way and like right. he can't really help it he was hit by his dad and like he had two alcoholic parents that like didn't deal with the root cause so like it's like I felt ashamed for coming from like two loving parents. Mm -hmm. And so I allowed the behavior. I mean, of course I didn't allow it, but I did by staying, right? right. Like passively allowed it. Um, and then I experienced a lot of shame around sexuality after being with him. Mm. Um, my own like sexuality was completely tampered with and like affected because he was so scary and like controlling and I mean he would literally like rip up my v-neck t-shirt it's like an innocent like you could wear that to like anything and right. he like took that as a threat and I'd come home to like my clothes being in shreds and like just sitting on my bed and mm -hmm. like nothing said and that kind of like behavior over time just wore me down and Did you guys talk about it I'd, that, I'd confront him some no I would confront him but like it it didn't matter because like the rage that he already experienced was over and so by the time that happened like I may kick him out for four days and then like he'd apologize and then he'd come back and you know like I didn't even know that he was like doing a lot of drugs at the time like I, I didn't know a lot I, I just knew that it was scary behavior that I just did my best to protect myself but I, I didn't realize that by protecting him in that way, it actually was hurting him. Like, I should have actually said something. Right. I think what I'm hearing is really, really important to note that there are so many different layers yeah. of shame. Yeah. And there, the shame that you experience or someone else experiences can also inflict shame on others, yeah. which is something that, like, we don't really talk yeah. about, right? Yeah. It's like shame is something that I own, but how yeah. is my shame affecting, affecting others? others? Yeah. So that's, like, really, really eye-opening for me, and I think for a lot of people listening, this idea yeah. that, you know, your shame has impact on others. Yeah, and well, so, like, if you think of it in a, like, less intense way, but it's, like, still really you know, not pleasant for the person experiencing it. It's like, I experience what I recognize a lot as a woman is like when women aren't f full of confidence or if they have insecurities or like issues around food, for example, mm -hmm. I feel that right away because mm -hmm. I used to have issues with food and because I'm just really observant. So like I'll be sitting with women. It doesn't happen as much anymore because my circles don't really like aren't really in that phase of their life but like when I'm around younger women in their 20s that are like discovering this kind of stuff I notice like the way they look at the menu and the anxiety around bread and the anxiety around what to order and like even you know they, it used to be so bad in college that the girls I'd with be like oh where are we going to dinner let's look at the menu ahead of time mm -hmm. so they could like pre-anxiety it up you know like pre mm -hmm. like be obsessive and like just all this fear and anxiety around food and so um that affects people you're around like it makes me not want to be around them because it's just so unhealthy and so like that behavior of just being kind of weird around food affects everyone you're sitting at the table with and right. 
makes it an unpleasant experience. So shame, if you're experiencing shame in your body, like how are you affecting those people that love you? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I think there are a lot of things that we go through in life that we don't think of as originating from shame, but have this deep layer of trying to pretend, trying to act as if, trying to be better than you feel like you are. Um, I mean, I really am starting to talk more about the, the role of shame and sexual assault from the man's point of view, from, or I guess, again, it depends on who's perpetrating, but I mean, more, more like from the quote unquote perpetrator point of view. And the reason I say that is I think oftentimes, you know, everybody also always talks about how sex is not, uh, sexual assault or rape is not about the sex, it's about the control. And I think that's true. I think it comes from the people who feel disempowered and they don't feel right. like they measure up. And so they go, oh yeah, well, I'll fucking show you. <laughs> you know, you don't want to have sex with me. If you don't have sex with me, that will bring shame on me. I will be the guy who couldn't get it or the guy you wouldn't sleep with. I'll show you. And that's another version of a guy trying to pretend like he's something that he isn't. There are, I'm writing a series of articles about this, but there are alpha males, right? Like just like in nature, there are these people who don't, who do kind of lean towards aggression and violence and control as their base way of operating. Um, but I think we've leaned far too long on the notion that that's what a man is. Mm. Like with anything else, the masculine has a, a spectrum. And yes, there are guys who, you know, you, they really have this inner need to control, be on top of the pyramid. Uh, we might have one of them in our office right now, or he's, or, uh, or he's just playing up his dad's desire for him to be one of those guys, right? Right. But all of us have dreamed or have thought of. I'd actually love to hear your thoughts on this, kind of, because I feel like around sexual orientation, this plays a huge role. Yeah. Is you feel like you have to be that guy. Mm -hmm. And so you do everything you can to pretend to be that guy. You wear the clothes, you drink the drinks, you do the drugs, Talk you, the way. you hook up with the women, mm -hmm. you do the stuff that you're supposed to do to be that guy. Oh, and, yes. and you feel shittier and shittier and shittier about who you are. And so eventually, if you know, if one of the rules, and I'm just bringing one up here uh, haphazardly, but if one of the rules is, hey, if I find somebody attractive and I go after her, I better be able to get her or uh, it means I'm not a man. Mm -hmm. If I really care about that mask, if I really care about that presentation to other people, if it doesn't work, it threatens who I am as a human. And if you go back to shame as a threat to your existence and your survival, fuck, if I'm not that man, everybody will make fun of me. Everybody will think less of me. I won't get the job. I won't get the other girls. I won't get the money. I won't get the respect. You do the thing you think you have to do to protect your image, your role. Uh, I mean, that for me 100% aligns with how I lived my life before I came out. You know, this idea that I had to be a certain way, I had to be the man, like just reiterating everything you said, it, yeah. it truly aligns with me. And this idea that like there's, there's so much shame inflicted on internally by like what we think other people are expecting of us, mm -hmm. right? And this is just from messaging, whether it's from media or from our parents or whoever we're learning from. And yeah. as a very young boy, you know, I was told by my father, you know, keep the legacy going, you need to give me grandchildren. And, uh, and I was thinking to myself, okay, well, that means I have to be with a woman, woman to yep. make that happen. Mm -hmm. And then, and the pressure, That's right? Of, so much wait, pressure. You're telling me if I decide that I don't want to be with women, I fuck up our family? Yeah. It's not even just on me anymore. So now talk about needing to man up, literally, right? Like needing to be the man that everybody expects you to be. Yeah, and I actually had a really, really great conversation with my dad on the show. Mm -hmm. And we talked all about when I was 10, you know, I was started, people started making fun of me and calling me gay. And I went to him and I was like, Dad, you know, what is gay? I don't even know what that is. People are calling me that. And he was like, son, I don't believe you're gay. And at that point, I, was, I convinced myself that I wasn't. Yep. And later on found out that my dad just wanted me to have a normal life. So he told me that right. when he knew oh. the truth. So, oh. you know, yes. And so we talked about I mean about the normal, right? Right. right. The normal is, again, we'll go back to the shame. If your inside doesn't match what you think other people expect from you, normal is the perfect word for that. Mm -hmm. If you don't feel normal, and we all have different versions of what normal is, by the way, then you will hide it. 
Mm -hmm. So what was that? You were 10 when that happened? Yeah. And, wow. and the thing about it is, is like, my parents are very liberal. Like I, I had a great childhood and like really grateful for growing up in that community in that home but there's lots of ideas of how you are supposed to be that will will allow you to live a life that is carefree and ultimately you know he was just trying to protect me from what he thought would be torment right. and and the reality is is that if all of that had not happened I would not be where I am do living the life and I believe sure. that everything happens as it's meant to yeah uh, it's just really important for me to touch on that that point that you know he was just doing what he felt was right right and, of course and that's i mean you know as parents like that's all all parents can do it's like yeah uh, here's the thing that is really interesting so we just led like i said this couple's workshop and i was talking to the men and i said look what we don't realize all of us is we got a book from our parents mm. a book of rules on how to be happy in life the problem is that was first of all their book mm -hmm. and it's an imp imperfect book because they weren't they were not perfectly happy and then there's the other issue, which is they're not living your life. So right. even if it were a perfect book for them, that doesn't mean it'll be perfect for you. The problem is nobody tells you that. Yeah. What they say is, hey, here's how you live a happy life. And they hand you the rules. And you believe, just like you believe everything else when you grow up, that if you follow those rules, you'll be happy. Mm -hmm. And then so many of us find that the we're same not. rules just don't apply to us. Yeah. <laughs> Some of us find that we do all this stuff. How many people do you talk to who are lawyers, doctors, um, you know, accountants, CEOs, whatever, they followed the path that was set for them. Mm -hmm. And they got there. They got to the peak. Mm -hmm. And they looked around and they went, I hate this. Yeah. yeah. Everyone. Mm -hmm. I think that's terrifying. <laughs> to me, that's even more terrifying than feeling lost. Because at least when you feel lost, you think, well, let me look for what will make me happy. But when you think you know what will make you happy, you're you on the do right it your path, whole life. Right. And then you get to it and you realize you're miserable. You have to question everything now. Yeah. You literally have to start questioning yourself, well, what is right? Uh, who lied to me along the way? What am I supposed to do from this point forward? And I think that's a really big thing for a lot of people to hear because it's not that your parents, I think this is changing a little bit right now, but it's not that your parents didn't tell you because they wanted to hold a seat from you. They didn't know. Mm -hmm. Your parents didn't know they were handing you the book. Mm -hmm. They didn't know that the book that they were reading from didn't make them fully happy. Yeah. And they definitely didn't know to tell you ahead of time, hey, I'm gonna hand you this book, edit it as much mm -hmm. as you'd like. Yeah. If you find that rule number 17 on page 456 doesn't, doesn't apply, yeah. scratch it out right. and find somebody who does live the kind of life you want, see how they do it, learn from their rules and incorporate it in. We do this all the time with our kids right now. So the joke, the running joke kind of at our house is our older boy, he's nine right now, he's like the poet, sits around, head in a book, nerdy. Playing chess. Playing chess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I always joked initially, which is actually funny, is that we're even talking about it right now. It's like, for all I know, like, Kai is the name. Like, he's gonna be like some poetic, beatnik, um, you know, loner later on in life. Leo, his younger brother, is athletic. He loves running around and getting violent very and aggressive. Physical. And very, very physical. Mm -hmm. yeah. But he also likes wearing women's shoes and painting his nails and wearing dresses. He loves a good frozen dress. Mm. And, and has thing, since he was two. <laughs> my thing was always, 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 I mean, let them do whatever the fuck they want. Because right. let them discover who they are instead of me trying to tell them who they are. Mm -hmm. So expose them to as many things as you want and then let them keep pursuing those things. Now, he also dresses and his style is amazing. Mm -hmm. So when he dresses in like fully gender, whatever fitting um, clothes, he also looks great. But I, the thing is right now, I don't know what that means. Does it mean that he likes wearing women's clothes and he always will? Does it just mean that he likes style? Mm -hmm. And he thinks to himself, my mommy wears dresses. I love my mom. My mom has style. I will wear what she wears. I don't know. Or does it just feel good to feel pretty? Sometimes it right. just feels good to feel pretty. You know, what I'm saying is compared to what you were talking about like at 10 years old, the problem is anything that I do right now is a projection of my expectations for him. And then anything I tell him not to do is me you know, following my rules of what mm. he should and shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. And again, the problem is I don't know which ones of those will lead him to happiness. Yeah, and maybe that's like the the thing to know, just to release that it's not your job to make sure that your kids are happy. It's your job to make sure that they have the space to explore what happiness means safe, to them. For them, love, yeah, they exactly. Feel supported, yeah. hundred percent. Love. And that's, I mean, even with my clients, whenever I work one on one with clients, you know, they come to me for quote food, but it's never about the food. Ever. It's never about the food, and we actually spend very little time now ever discussing food. I don't. 
I'm so past the point of like, here is a prescription of what you should be eating every day. Like, yeah, sure. no, you actually know what you should be eating and what you shouldn't be eating today. You know, now we need to figure out together, how do we get to that intuitive place so that your intuitive body is so strong, it will guide you into what is right and what is wrong for you and what you should be eating for your body today. And that's basically the way it is in life with joy. Like our job is just to help our kids and our loved ones go through their days and find that intuitive voice that guides them in the right direction so that they, if that voice is so strong and so clear that no matter what, when we're gone and we're away, when we don't see them day to day, they have that voice and that they can direct themselves to find their own version of what joy looks like. Yeah. And that could be wearing a blue dress and heels from Frozen and that could be wearing a, a leather jacket and it could be being gay and it could be being trans and it could be none of the above and we have no idea mm -hmm. because none of that matters it's just whatever he chooses it's just right. whatever he chooses and us loving him 100 percent fully no matter what it is that makes him happy because we believe that we've guided him in the right way that he's going to choose the things that bring him joy so I hear everything you're saying and it's and it, it's really potent and I'm just like, I, I'm so excited for all of the parents to hear this, mm -hmm. but you know, and how do you release that? Because so many people, you know, don't have the opportunity to be surrounded by a community that's accepting. So, you know, the blessing that is living in California, I feel for a lot of us is that like, there's that freedom, but what I would you tell that. the parent who is like, that feels so good, but I don't want my kid to get beaten up or I don't want my, well, you know, like, how do you, how do you do that? I love it. So first of all, I think there's a huge secret in the entire conversation that we're having. And that is the fact that when you start owning up to these things without fear, other people come out of the woodwork. Mm -hmm. yeah. Inevitably, You're there people. are other people surrounding you right now that are scared. They are scared of being their true self because they feel like they have to adhere to some standards. And the moment you come out and say, you know what guys, look, I don't know what's going on with my son, but I'm gonna support him through whatever he needs. I would appreciate you telling your kids, if they don't wanna play with him, that's fine, but I would appreciate you telling your kids that we're respecting his his choices. That's what his parents are deciding to do. Whatever that is, inevitably, I think you will end up finding people around. It might just be one parent or yeah. two or three. They're saying, oh my God, it's finally it's fun fucking saying this. Mm -hmm. We're stuck in the you know 1800s and we didn't even realize it. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing that is so powerful about shame and it's why Sophie and I do the work that we do and talk about the things that we talk about even though a lot of people really are turned off by it and they go, this is too much. I don't like you sharing this much. Is, yeah. It's not for those people, it's for the people who are struggling. Because the moment we give the people who are ashamed and are ashamed the permission, the power, the the anchor to say, oh my God, there's somebody else like me, yeah. we empower them to start resonating. And now and you get a tidal wave effect because they start speaking up about what's going on for them. And then 12, 13, 14, then 1400, then <laughs> thousands and millions of people resonate to the message. And the message is, look, yes, 500 years ago, 10,000 years ago, 40,000 years ago, maybe conformity had to be the rule. Because if you didn't, look, let's, let's be honest, right? If you weren't able to propagate the species and you lived in a 12 person tribe and you were one of three men and they really relied on you to keep having kids, otherwise the tribe would not survive. Okay, if you didn't like violence and decided not to hunt and therefore they lost three people in their tribe that was gonna go hunt for food and people would starve because of it, Maybe there was a reason. We don't live in that world anymore. We just don't. Right. We also don't live in the disconnected world where you only have the 12 people around you. Mm -hmm. You can connect. You know, I run this online program for mental health and addiction issues. We have people in Australia, in the UK, all over the States, in Canada, all over the place. So yesterday I did a chat and there's a guy from Canada and a woman from the UK and like 12 different people from all over the States talking and sharing and having this conversation. So your tribe no longer has to be defined by the people who are geographically around mm. you. And that is a huge power for That's all true. of us to, to hold on to and yeah. say, you know what? Find your people. Maybe I don't fit in where I am in the moment, but I fit in somewhere. Mm. And the moment you find those people, the shame disappears because if shame is what happens when you don't feel like you're good enough compared to the people around you, and then you find people around you that are okay with who you are, the shame goes down. Yeah. And then you can start growing into the person you are. I'd love to actually hear from you. So 10 years old, that thing happened with your dad. Mm -hmm. You said to yourself, well, I'm not gay. Yeah. At what point did the pressure inside become big enough where you said, I've got to make some changes? 
um, I was I didn't come out until I was 25. Got it. Wow. And and after that point, the the shame around that, I ended up going back into the closet, mm. dating women again, and then finally after moving in with this girl, I couldn't. I I looked. I woke up one day and I was like, "Who is this human staring back at you?" Mm. Like I had. I was really overweight. Mm. I was so miserable. I was like drinking so much wine every night there just to go. get through it, yeah. right? And like numbing out That's on this. Yeah. And, and then I also had like a shopping addiction and all this stuff mm -hmm. just to make myself feel better. And the second that I said, I can't do this anymore, and I, I left the relationship, it's like within two weeks, 20 pounds had fallen off mm -hmm. of me. My dream job- way down by yes. this slot. Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. so that that really was the, the beginning of my self-love story uh -huh. and really like this massive shift. And of course, like I was resistant to it and didn't understand that I kept continuing to, to choose partners that were the exact same as this girl who was very emotionally abusive to me and told me that if I didn't know that this, what we had was happiness after telling her that like I was attracted to men and all this stuff and granted like, it's not her fault, right? Like I can take complete ownership for not having the courage and the strength to fully do it until I did. Uh, but there was just so many things and I kept on picking the wrong people who were exactly the same way, just with different genitalia and different, you know, yeah. whatever. So it's just a, it was a very interesting long journey for me to realize that I matter most and now, of course, taking that messaging out to everyone, being like, all of this, the shame that you own, everything is like owning it, that it's yours and you have complete control over it, you know, for 99.99% .99 of the time, mm. how you're feeling. Yeah, I think that's that's such an important message to hear, right? You mentioned Sophie before, uh, and you talked about it too, that um, the way your shame affects other people, mm -hmm. and you just gave a perfect example of it. You dated women, and the reason you dated women was because you were trying to figure out how to deal with this inner conflict. Mm -hmm. And the best way to deal with it was to wear the mask, to pretend to yeah. be like everybody wanted you to be. It caused you pain. Mm -hmm. And not purposefully, but what it did is it created these little relationships, these little mini kind of explosions that went off in the world because we weren't true to who we are. Yeah. Yes. And what I think we're realizing more and more, and this is something I, I mentioned in... Uh, in a recent talk is I want everybody to just pause and think about the people you admire in life. Just pick a, a list. I don't know. One, if you can't think of more than one. But most of us have, you know, I don't know, six, seven, eight, nine. <laughs> six, seven, eight, nine, ten, fifty people that we think are amazing in the world. Now, I want you to circle any of the people on that list that you admire because they're like everybody else in the world. Mm. And I guarantee there's not a single person on that list. Yeah. There's not a single Ooh. person on that list that you look up to and you go, you know what? They're totally normal and they do everything exactly the way everybody does it. I really look up to this person. There's something you admire in that person specifically because they break the rules. Specifically because... Now, breaking the rules could just be that you're Christian and they are so devout, so loving of God that, that God loses from them and every word that they say is His word but they're breaking a mold, right? Mm -hmm. They're not acting like everybody else. They're not ashamed of their religion and they own it, so you love them. Um, there are hundreds of different variations of this, but whenever we look at people, the reason, like look at J.K. Rowling, right? I use, love using her as an example because everybody looks at her now as the most successful author on the face of the earth. That woman lived in a car with her kids. She had right. no money. She got rejected by like 12 book agents, I think. And then after finally a book agent was willing to take her on, she got rejected by about a dozen publishers. Mm -hmm. How many of us would be willing to go through 12 agent rejections and then 12 publisher rejections yeah. for our first book that we'd spent years poor and writing and keep going for the 25th, 26th time? Mm -hmm. If she hadn't, we would. And by the way, people told her, like, nobody wants to read about wizard kids. What are you talking about? <laughs> wizards? Who reads about wizards? It is now the biggest book ever in the history of like yeah. fiction. Series, yeah. It's insane. But it would have never happened if she didn't just keep going being different. So this, we have this dichotomy that exists in our world, which is we constantly try to be like everybody else, but nobody 
nobody nobody is appreciated just for being like everybody else mm. so if you flip that on its head you go okay fuck being like everybody else forget that what makes me me yeah. what makes me exactly. unique yep. and let me go all in on that the only thing that matters and that's why when you asked in the beginning kind of like what do we want to be known as I really had to whittle that down because my mind is busy <laughs> and I will create 500 different answers to that and I, had to, I remember it was like two years ago maybe I think where I was like at a conference or something and I it hit me like I want impact that's what I care about I want to make massive massive change like the kind of change I'm in the addiction of mental health space where long after I'm dead people will be able to say this book changed things mm-hmm. or this th- series of books changed things or we used to look at things this way but then this guy allowed us to change the way we looked at it and look at the, the follow through and so then if I if I write about it it actually takes my work away from me it's not about me yeah it's I want to create impact that's what picture. makes it important I got to go study I got to go learn I got to look at the best and model the best and understand how do I create impact how do I actually change people's lives not just talk and think about it Mm. and if all the people listening right now just fuck being regular fuck being normal you don't look up to anybody in the world because they're normal be (laughs) you but just be the best version of yourself stop giving yourself a break stop waking up in the morning and going well you know I'll be like a 40% version of myself and a 60% version of what everybody else wants to do that's shit That, that is useless the world cannot use you in that way yeah. and if you just commit to being all in yes there will be friction yes like with that woman who yelled at you if you don't understand this is happiness then something is wrong with your head yeah. right there will be some destruction in your world right now because you built the world based on pretending to be like everybody else and I think for the parents that you were talking about and for anyone that's listening that wants to live this way you need to find at least one person who can support you in that mm-hmm one person it can be a friend it can be a neighbor it can be an elder it can be someone younger that you're mentoring but kind of they're mentoring you <laughs> someone that can support you on your journey to being the best version yes. of you because a D and I constantly have to help each other like when I'm you know getting people sending me crazy messages or pushing down what it is I'm saying in my message and lashing out or telling me I'm this or telling me I'm that like he has to remind me that that's part of being on the right path is like having people like when you're ruffling feathers it's a good thing yeah and so but it's not easy it's not easy to be someone like I, of course we want everyone to love us it's impossible mm-hmm. you don't oh, want yeah. everyone to love you you don't Especially want everyone everybody to love else you. Is stuck in their own crazy internal story of what yeah. is okay and what is not okay mm-hmm. i guarantee like so you were 25 when you came on then you went back in yeah and so finally you came out when uh when i was 27 27 years old mm-hmm. and has it then since then every time you own your sexuality everybody's just like that's amazing nobody's ever talked shit about it yeah nobody i mean i was when i came out the first time everyone was like oh great what's for dinner and i was like really you know i'm doing <laughs> like this for some it to be yeah <laughs> yeah 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 so it, it was definitely like some some people just didn't even acknowledge it because they were like wait this this is a thing like you're coming out right like, um mm. and and that for me was an interesting pain point because I had tried for so long to be this version of someone that I thought other people expected me to be. And they didn't buy it because it just wasn't fucking true. Right, right. <laughs> you know, that's what I, I think that's, that's, that's so important for people to hear. Like, we all know. Yeah. Right? The reason you're mad at everybody, the reason it's not working mm-hmm. out the way you want it to is because you're not maximizing self. Right. And it's easier to point your finger out at other people and blame them for this experience than take ownership for what you can control and how you can live your life. Yeah. yeah. And just so we're clear, you know, again, sorry, I keep going back to this conversation. I, I have these conversations every Tuesday with my people and um, it's an ongoing process. Yeah. So the thing is, you'll find the biggest one that needs to fall and you'll go and you'll address that one. Mm. And then it'll open up your eyes to, oh, damn it. Mm-hmm. There's all these other things that I haven't been paying attention to that I've been pretending I feel okay about and it's like exactly like layers of onion You just you peel them off and you just keep doing that. It's an iterative process You go through the rest of your life becoming a better and better version of yourself well, yeah. and Healing isn't linear. It's mm-hmm. it's cyclic, you know, and it's like it's actually more like a spiral <laughs> You know, so you like take the layers off But then you're like over on this side and you're like wait I thought that I just took all those layers off and like feel really vulnerable but oh now we're going around this way and now we're down and it's yeah. more of like a spiral than anything else and it's forever we're healing forever we're yes. doing the work forever i also don't think that healing is finite right no. like, like the idea that 
one day you're finally going to be healed. Just no, because like you heal one, you heal one thing, and then the next it leads to another thing. Uh -huh. like the work is always there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I would love to play our first road trip game yes. if you're willing. Okay, so Sophie, there's there are some red cards there. This okay. is from my favorite game ever. It's called We're Not Really Strangers. I would love you to just choose a card. Okay. There's a question, and we're all going to answer it. I might break things up a little. What title would you give this chapter in your life? Mm. Um, I think the chapter I'm in now is integration. Mm. I like it. Yeah. Cool. Um, I'm going to call mine the reveal. <laughs> um. Life's a drag, not not being true to yourself. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I love it. So, to hop back into this whole idea of just like finding your your people and yeah. and knowing that you know something that I I've really experienced as of late as I continue to step further and further into my truth who I am is that there are also going to be people who are not into that and yes. will either leave yes. or not you want that right and you want that you want that 100%. you want to create you want to free the space yeah yeah because I'll have like I've just recently like started exploring dressing in drag and every yeah. time I post something on Instagram I'll lose like 300 Great. followers bye. which is by yeah. like amazing yeah. And yeah. so it's really, that's just an important yes. message to yes. share that like yes. you are going to, as you said, ruffle feathers. Clear and... out that space mm -hmm. because then the right people will come yeah. in. And yeah. the same thing goes if you're a parent and you're exploring new things with your kid. Like you don't need the people that are naysayers, not supportive, against it, not going to support the best growth. Same thing goes like for our relationship. Like we stayed together after cheating and worked it out and a lot of people don't want to hear about that because they think once a cheater always a cheater yeah. or you know um it just is like makes them makes well, feelings it triggers, it it triggers, triggers their stuff it triggers yeah. their own and stuff it, and here's a funny thing right you'll have people who totally support you being gay but as long as you wear men's clothes right right it's like at their own totally support you being gay as long as you don't actually share a picture you're kissing a man mm -hmm. right like everybody has their rules and their boundaries and First of all, I think challenging other people's boundaries is a good thing mm -hmm. because then they have to think carefully about those things. Yep. And also, Sophie said this before, look, there's seven and a half billion people on this planet. <laughs> They're not all going to like you. Right. And what would it be like if they did? I mean, you, I, I kind of feel like you don't want them to. Mm -hmm. We were talking about tribe before. All I'm trying to do is find my tribe. Mm -hmm. And yes, like I said with Impact before, I hope my tribe is large. But if it's not, let me go in as deep as possible and find the core people that make me feel like the best version of myself. You know, we're talking on this podcast right now. Um, I used to, I remember the first time, Sophie, that you had me record a video because I've been speaking and writing for 10, 12 years. But the first time on Instagram that Sophie had me do a video, I was really self-conscious and it felt really weird and awkward. Mm. And the only reason I, over time, decided to overcome it was because I decided it was a medium where... I needed to talk to a different group of people that wouldn't have reached me in that way. Mm -hmm. We, f I find, for me, that a lot of my social anxiety, not all of it, but a lot of my social anxiety, a lot of the depression that I used to go through in life and everything like that was really based on not feeling like I was good enough, not feeling like the people around me would like me, not feeling like I was appreciated. And it was probably a little true because I was constantly pretending. So I was yeah. trying to be something that those people wanted me to be. And I wasn't. But people like can said, feel you, when you're not being authentic. Yeah, like, people like can said, feel when you're not being genuine. People mm. can feel when you're hiding parts of yourself or masking parts of yourself or trying to be like someone else. Like you can feel, even if you don't know someone that well, you can feel when something's off. Yes. And that's not attractive. Mm -hmm. I'm attracted to someone being fully in their power, mm -hmm. whatever that looks like. Mm -hmm. From well, we, all, we all know this. Yeah. Like look at actors, look at people that you you again, you look up to. Yes, attractiveness is um is up on the like totem pole of what you like. But there are people who are incredibly successful and incredibly charismatic and good looks is not number one on their list. Yeah. Right. What is it? Think about it. What what it is is they own themselves. They know who they are. They they have become and they keep trying to become a better version of that. Mm, yes they do. And, and that's that's just that's it. And that's self-love. And that's that self -love. loving all parts to yourself and owning it because 
there's only one of you uh. and that is your power that is your superpower is loving the shit out of all parts of you and by the way I'll, I'm gonna put a little plug in here like this ignited is about helping people find that core find that purpose that's yep. why it's called ignited right how can we help people get ignited yeah um, and so we have our podcast too Thank you for having us on your Absolutely. Um, we have these weekly chats and we're adding more and more of them where that's the whole point is find your tribe. So even if you're in Idaho, you can connect to people from all over the world that believe and trust and support you. Um, you know, I have my book. Sophie has um, her amazing Instagram um, channel that really helps people identify. I mean, you know, we're parents now. There are also standards of what parents are supposed to do. Right. And we're constantly navigating that and trying to help people find the message that resonates with them. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's really beautiful. And I am really excited for everyone to connect with you and and journey into that feeling of being ignited around yeah. whatever it is that whatever you want it is. to be. Yeah. Okay, so I just have a couple of more questions. Yes. Yeah. What does self-love mean to you? self-love means acceptance and I was almost picturing when you asked that question like a deep emotional and psychological hug internal hug right holding yourself mm -hmm. and allowing yourself to feel safe secure and worthy exactly where you are right now yeah I think it's being your own best friend like, it's really nice to just be alone and love being alone and, and like just loving the shit out of yourself and the time you spend with you, like honing that, that relationship with yourself and feeling whole within yourself and doing the work, even when it feels messy, like self love. If you look at like truly loving a partner, self love is like that, but with yourself. So how can you date yourself, love yourself, marry yourself, be best friends with yourself. And when I'm teaching my class, my like yoga classes, I always say like, how would you talk to your best friend? Like that's how you should be talking to yourself all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's a practice, but it's so possible. And if you love yourself and that relationship with yourself is so strong and so whole, then that's the way that you're stepping into your life right. and your relationships. Mm. Yep. Love it. I love being alone. You know, like I love being alone. I love all the things that come along with that. I love journaling and dancing alone and not looking at what someone else is doing. Like just yeah. dancing because it feels good to music that I love, not someone else loves. And, you know, it's sometimes the exact same songs over and over again. And like that's what makes me feel good mm -hmm. because it tunes me into a certain vibration. And that vibration is self love. And, you know, like, all of it, all of the practices that come along with that. It just, it's so necessary, mm. you know? And like, I moved around from second grade until 10th grade every single year. And I lived in either a different house or went to a different school. And I was all I had. Like, I changed schools, changed friends, changed neighbors. Um, it was just a lot of chaos and right. like, finding that relationship with myself over and over again and just being my own best friend and being like cool like here we go again it's an adventure I've got my journal I've got my photos I've got my games I've got my this I've got my dolls whatever like these things bring me joy and I'm just chilling you know and like when I can when I don't have enough me time and like really really being with myself not like me time like actually being on loving myself and having that time that's when everything else in my life becomes better and that's when I get intuitive messages intuitive hits that's where I like connect with my spiritual self mm -hmm. like there's so much magic in just being still with yourself but you have to create that space and that safety and that trust or else none of that's coming like yeah. if you have to be busy all the time and be around people all the time you're not going to get any of those intuitive messages you're not going to get you're not going to know what you really need mm-hmm without giving, creating that space. Can you just, for yeah. someone who's like really freaking out about the idea of being alone, yeah. how do you start that practice? 
Um, I would say like take a bath, like get some yummy, like treat yourself to some Epsom salts and um, maybe an essential oil you like and yeah. light a candle and make it almost like a ceremony, like with yourself, a date with yourself. And so then take a bath and just allow it to like start small. Let it be an hour where you soak in the tub and you read a book and you put your phone away and you just love yourself. And then when you get out of the bath, you put lotion on and just... Say, as if you're talking to a lover or a best friend, the thoughts you're thinking being really connected to just yes. love. And that's it. Just let it be an hour. And, and then if, if, it, you, doesn't, if yeah. it doesn't last an hour, it lasts 20 or 30 minutes. That's great too. Congratulate yourself for making it to 20 sure. or 30 minutes. And, yeah. and keep doing it. And Building. you'll feel more comfortable with time. And then you'll start mm. to look forward to it. It might feel a little awkward and like you want to fill up the space. Like allow it to feel a little weird yeah, and awkward. I was awkward. already thinking to myself, like, shit, can I bring a book? <laughs> Which is funny. I love it. I love what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you've got homework tonight. I do. Yeah. I do. I do. <laughs> homework. So, so uh, where can everyone find you if they're like super resonant? Like, pl do all the plugs. Yeah. Tell them all the places. I'm on Instagram, Sophie.jaffe. And uh, my superfood company is Philosophy Love. And it's spelled with my name, Philosophy. Um, I-E and then love on Instagram. Mm. And my blog is thephilosophy.com and we sell tons of superfood products that I created and they're a lot so of, good. they're so good and good for you. And it's self love, you know, constantly when you're adding it to your foods. Um, and then our podcast is ignited. You can find us at ignited.com or ignited.me, um, on Instagram. Yeah. So ignited.me on Instagram, ignited.com is the website yep. and, uh, our podcasts are on there too, but obviously you can find us on Spotify. You can find us on iTunes um, podcast app, all those wonderful places. Yeah, amazing. And well, your Instagram, yes. Oh, my Instagram was Doctor Adi Jaffe. Yeah, you and I'm are Adi Jaffe. I'm gonna lift list everything in the show notes. Awesome, and you guys. Thank you so much for thank joining you. me. This was such a powerful conversation. Thank you and I'm for so us. excited to share it. How beautiful is our neighborhood? I mean, the most beautiful. <laughs> I'm, I'm moving <laughs> in. I'm like falling more now. and more in love with it. <laughs> Thanks for this drive. You're so <laughs> welcome. Yay. Well, with that being said. We'll see you next time yeah. on the road to self-love. Bye. Bye <laughs>